Tonight, I want to preach uh, a message with uh, a special somebody, and to be frank and honest, when I say I want to preach, what I mean is uh, um, I'm not really the one that came up with this word. In fact, whatever it was that I would have spoke tonight, that I would have preached on, basically got scrapped. And the reason being is because, again, Holy Spirit's got me in a place where it's time for you guys to take charge. It's time for you guys to lead each other, because if you guys can lead each other in here, then you sure as well can lead a generation out there. And it's time to practice in here because this is a safe place. We get to be safe in here with it. So what ended up happening was there was words. There were a lot of words that were written down and all of them basically got erased because this individual wrote way more words that were way prettier sounding than the words that were already there. So they're going to preach for you tonight. I'm just going to kind of give an outline real quick. Um, so we are in First John. Okay. Um, if you guys have your Bibles or have some way to turn there, we're going to go to First John chapter four, seven through twelve. Uh, so not to take too much time to ch to teach, but um, as you guys read through your Bibles, uh, understand that there's sometimes multiple books that sound similar. This is one of them. With the Gospel of John, this is not the Gospel of John. This is a, a letter from John. Okay, so he wrote three letters to a church that really was struggling and needed some help. So this is kind of some information um, that can be, it's as pertinent today as it was back then. Because we need to know this is the church. Okay, here's the deal. The world stinks at love. The world's definition of love is stupid because it's Disney. Um, that's the definition of the world's love. And, and, and here's, what, here's, what, uh, here's what we want to talk about tonight. What me and this wonderful, amazing individual want to talk about tonight is real relationships. Okay, We're going to open up a new discussion, and it, it very much coincides with everything we spoke in the last five weeks. The last five weeks, we were in purity. Now we're moving on to what makes us pure. What makes us pure is doing our relationships well. Okay, The only way that we get to walk through life with purity in every way is to do our relationships well. That's friendships, that's family, that's dating, that's... And these two subjects, love and forgiveness. What we're opening up with tonight is love. So 1 John chapter 4 Verses 7 through 12 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. It is so imperative that we know how to love the right way. It's so imperative because the gospel doesn't get out and people's lives don't get changed. How many of you guys, how many of you guys that are here tonight, you came here because somebody walked up to you and said, I hate you, come to youth group with me? That'll make no sense at all. But somebody invited you to come and you obviously feel some form of peace around that person because coming into this group, it's a rowdy bunch in here. <laughs> But we want to be a loving, rowdy bunch. So we're going to talk about that tonight. I'm going to invite the wonderful, the amazing. She challenges my life. She makes me want to be a better person and a better human because she flat lives it. Her name is Faith. Faith, if you would come up here and join me, please. Faith is going to go ahead and she's going to preach this message on love to you guys tonight. So as soon as she gets her uh, little handy dandy microphone so that our online um, presence can listen. Hey! Hope you guys glad you're with us. So, by the way, if you guys ever want to go back in the archive, 
guys were on YouTube and Facebook, so you guys can go and find the videos if you want to. That's the reason for the miniature little microphone, so, so Faith can watch herself. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, hi. Um, so Pastor Colin already kind of introduced what we were talking about, but I'm going to say it again. So tonight we're talking about love. And some of you might get like a, might be like, oh, like, okay, or really, like, talking about that, you know what I mean? Because, or some of you might even be offended by it, you know, like, love seriously. But that's because the world has made love into something that it's not. Um, you see, the world defines love as intense feelings of affection towards someone else. They try to convince you love is how you get what you want, or you say you love something when you want it, right? I can straight up tell you that that is wrong. Love is not a feeling. Love is a decision that you make. Um, and it's not a decision that you make once. Like when you tell your siblings you love them, or like when you get married, you guys tell each other you love each other and promise to love them forever, right? And then it's all sandy dandy. Nope, love is a decision that you have to make, but it's not one that stops there. You have to make that choice every day. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude or self-seeking. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. This describes, in a nutshell, what the Bible says love is. Huh. Not a single one of those words describes butterfly feelings or, you know, the smileys, like those sorts of things. It doesn't. All of these words are actions, verbs. They are all things that you do. If that is the Bible's definition of love, which is the only accurate or real definition of love, then just think how far off and how messed up the world's love is. And I promise you that you're going to fail at love, like real love, but the important thing is, is that you're always trying. You're always making the conscious, con conscious decision to love people. Love isn't about how you feel. Something that we know is that, you know, emotions can cloud your judgment. Have any of you ever had an emotion that couldn't be trusted? See, emotions can lead you astray. Not that feeling things is bad or having emotions, because that's part of what makes us human, but emotions can negatively impact us when they take place of actions. Love is a verb, or actions, or action, or actions. When you say to someone that you love them, it's a proclamation. You are proclaiming that you're going to do all these things of 1 Corinthians, etc. And God is the perfect example of love. He is love. God shows us the perfect example of love. He's the best role model. He's the best guidebook to follow. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a story. And it's kind of, I don't know, I think it kind of goes hand in hand with this. So newspaper columnist, Minister George Crane, tells of a wife who came into his office full of hatred towards her husband. Like she, like, hated his guts. She said, I do not only want to get rid of him, I want to get even. I want to hurt him as much as he has hurt me. So Dr. Crane suggested an ingenious plan. Go home and act as if you really love him. Um, tell him how much he means to you, praise him for every decent trait, you know, hang out with him, do fun things, be as kind and considerate as possible, and as generous as possible. Spare no efforts to please him and to enjoy him. Make him believe that you love him. After you have convinced him of your undying love and that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. <laughs> Tell him that you're getting a divorce. That will really hurt him. With revenge in her eyes, she smiled. Beautiful, beautiful. And that's exactly what she did. Acting as if for two months she showed like love, compassion, caring, empathy, you know, like she really loved him, right? And then when she didn't return, Crane called. Are you ready to go through with the divorce now? Divorce, she exclaimed. Never. I discovered I really do love him. 
Her actions changed her feelings. Motion resulted in emotion. Okay, now this is a really important thing that like sums up the whole story. The ability to love is established not so much by fervent promise as much as repeated deeds. Okay, I'll say that one more time. The ability to love is established not so much, not by fervent promise as much as repeated deeds. Does anyone know what that means? Okay, well, it means like just by saying that you love some or telling, telling yourself that you love them, it doesn't make it true. You have to keep repeating those deeds and those actions. You have to show it, basically. I'm not telling you that if you go and love people that everything will magically become okay because that's not the truth. But when you love people, you change something in your own heart. You don't necessarily change the person when you love them. You change the way you feel towards them. Your mindset changes. If you're having a hard time loving others or you're just really struggling to, struggling, <laughs> struggling to show compassion and empathy and these sorts of things, or like whenever you feel a snarky remark come on, or you just want to back talk, or you know you want to think something in your head where no one else will hear, or maybe even want to talk behind their back. Just try little things, try little actions to practice love. Because the more you practice it, not necessarily the easier it will become, but the more it will have effect on both you and possibly the other person. If you're already in the mindset of loving people, then when a time comes when you're really really struggling to love a person, then you're already in the practice of showing it. You're already in the mindset of trying your best to love people. You're already in the practice of asking God to help you love them. Okay, 1 John 3.18. Dear children, let us not love with speech, with words or speech, but with actions and truth. This is once again the Bible telling us that it's not about words, or it's not about saying I love you or making sure that they know it. You need to show it. You need to practice it as well. When times come when someone is making it difficult for you to love them, you're already in that mindset of, you know, trying your best to love them. And notice how I say practice, because love isn't something that you're going to be perfect at. You're not, because we all make mistakes, right? As long as you try your best and want to do your best to show people that you love them. Not halfway, or when you feel like it, or if someone's nice to you, then you try, or, you know. Um, no, I mean you love your enemies, and you love people that you don't get along with. You love people who give you a hard time, people who persecute you and hurt you. You love those who you don't agree with or don't agree with you. Most importantly, though, is that you share God's love. When God says love your enemies and love people in general, he's not talking about the world's love, like giving them flowers and sending good morning and good night texts and opening doors for them and you know giving them gifts. Well, those are not bad things. The whole point is about showing God's love. If you think about it, it's not yours because everything you are is because of God, if that makes sense. Humans don't know how to love. God teaches us. He shows us by example. So therefore, God is love. So any love we give is God's love. Think of it in a way that you are showing people the way God has loved you and the way God wants you to love people. Loving people through God's love, not your own or the world's. Real love is not trying your best to love them the way the world says you should love them. No matter how hard you try to love like the world, the world's love will always, always fail. The world's love is 100% conditional. But Jesus' love will never fail because it is unconditional. Will we mess up at loving God's way? Yep. But even still, God's love, real, perfect love, will never fail. He loves us. He, his love never fails. He cares for us. He protects us. He shows us. He leads us. His love never fails. So if we have his love in us, doesn't it make sense for us to love a hurting and broken world? We have been shown and given perfect love. Why not love people who have never been shown love? Or if they have, it was only the world's, and then we know how that ends up. 
The two greatest commandments are to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. When you love your neighbor, you're actually giving or showing them the way God has loved you. It is not your love that you are giving. We need to realize what perfect love is. It's, is it like loving pe- people the way God wants me to? Is it trying my best to love not like the world? What can I do differently from the world love? Real love is good. It will be beneficial. It will help people. It will build them up. It will be there when you need it, and it will be trustworthy. To show God's love, you need to get out of the mindset of solely loving your family, your friends, or peer groups. While, yes, we need to love our family, and we need to show love to our friends, but, and we need to have compassion and empathy for our people at school, you know. But while we have... But we seem to have gotten stuck on solely loving the people that we're comfortable with, not getting out of our comfort zone. This is not what God wants. God loves everyone. He is not stingy with his love. So why are we? When you love people, it's not yourself that you're putting in. It's what God has already put in you. So therefore, you have to ask God every day to help you love people, and you need to ask him to show you how to love people the right way. You can't just say, oh, I'm always going to show perfect love, like, you know, because the world's going to tear you down, and it's going to take God's love from you. Not the love that God has for you, but your ability to love the world unconditionally. The world's going to lie to you. It's going to tear you down. It's going to make you feel like you don't have any love to give, or if you have love, it's not worth giving, or maybe you don't even feel like loving anyone because what's the point, right? That's why every day you need to ask for God's love and ask him to help you love others and for him to show you how to love others the right way. God's love is perfect, and the only form of perfect love or the only actual form of love is God's love. And all the romance things that we see on TV, like Disney, like Pastor Colton was saying, or even turning away from romance, like friendship love, you know, hanging out with friends, or the friends you see on Pinterest where they're doing these fun, amazing things and going on road trips and making friendship bracelets and doing promise tokens and, you know, all these sorts of things. Well, yeah, you might have a good friendship then, but when struggles come or if they're making it hard for you to love them, that's when you see the biggest difference between the world's love and God's love. The world's love is always, I love you until, or I love you if you do this, or I love you if this happens, or I love you when, or I love you because of all sorts of things. All of these statements are basically saying, my love for you isn't conditional. Who likes to hear that? So I'd be like, oh, I love you, but remember, it's conditional. Right? Not, not cool, right? I love you forever. We will always be together. We will always be best friends. Until I decide not to love you anymore. Or until you do something that takes me off. Or until... I find a more popular friend group, or until, you know, or until, or until I lose feelings, right? Heard that one. God's love is unconditional. He loves you unconditionally, even though you turn away from him and you sin against him. That is unconditional love. How honestly can we say that if people are hurting us, or our friends, or our family, that we can still honestly love them? You might be thinking, oh, I I can't love them, or I don't have any love in my heart for them. And you're right, you don't. Because only God has the love that you can give people. One of the key differences between the world's love and God's love is simply, God's love is unconditional. The world's love is entirely conditional. Love your enemies. That's not something that we hear in the world. It's get even with your enemies, or only love people who can give you something in return. Then once they can't anymore, or once you're bored of them, you know, just move on. It's okay. There's plenty of people. See the pattern? God says that we need to love in a way that is unconditional. And oh my goodness, yet another difference that we see between the world's love and God's love is that God's love will never fail. The world's love will always fail. It will fail entirely. As simple as that. God's love will never fail. So we need to learn to love in a way that not necessarily won't fail, but in a way that is unconditional and that 
in a way that God has loved us. Meaning we need to learn to love through hard times. We need to learn when, you know, we just don't feel like loving or we're having a bad day or, you know, we just need to practice always loving people. We need to learn to show compassion and empathy and love for our enemies. We need to learn to pray for people and pray for them in a way that's like, oh God, please help me to love them or please help them this, rather than, oh God, like, please just help them not to say anything to me at school. Like, we need to change our mindset when it comes to those sorts of things. We need to learn to hold our tongues and not say things that we regret or be like, oops, hopefully they didn't get offended by that. If that crosses your mind, then probably shouldn't have said it whether or not they get offended by it. And it's not solely like, oh, like I said, telling people or holding your tongues. You just, you have to show it. It has to be continuous. It has to be something that you're asking God every single day. And if you mess up, that's okay, but you need to ask for forgiveness or you need to say, oh, what's, what's causing in my heart for me to mess up or why, why am I in a bad mood or why do I feel this way towards this person? And you need to ask God for help because, like I said, humans don't know how to love. God teaches us how to love and he shows us by example. But most of all, we just need to change our mindset when it comes to love, and we need to change our mindset when it comes to the world's love and when it comes to God's love. Since God shows us unconditional love, why are we so stingy with ours? I finished. I love, I love what Faith said. I love what Faith said a couple of times um, that we don't, we don't know how to love. God teaches us how to love. Um, do you guys know that that's not actually the way that we are originally created? God made us in His image, therefore He originally intended for us to love wholeheartedly. But we chose to be recreated. We basically looked at God at the beginning of time and said, God, your creation sucks, so I'm going to go with this other guy. And that other guy was a snake. Literally a snake talking to Eve. And she chose to listen to him and recreate herself into somebody that now everyone has to be taught how to love by God. But really what we're being taught to do is be who we were originally made to be. I love that faith. That was beautiful. Tonight we're going to do a little bit of practice on, on how to get to that place in our hearts. How to get to that place where we genuinely and truly can love people. No matter what's going on. Because some of you might be in here tonight and you might think, oh, a love thing. I know how to love. I know how to have feelings. Pfft. Jeez, this is a simple topic. Let's talk about something else. I promise you that there are going to be moments that each of you struggle with how to love the way that God intends you and built you to love. And here's how I know why. Faith spoke about an enemy and how we've got to know how to love an enemy. I pause for effect there because I'm fairly certain that as I say enemy, you guys are probably thinking of someone right now off the top of your head. You've got that person in your mind that frustrated you, that burned you down, that hurt you, that made you angry. The test to see whether or not you can actually love is if you can forgive.
There are some people in here tonight that you've been so hurt by someone. That you want to you want to love everyone else. I don't want to love that one. No, it's not that I don't want to. I can't love that one. I'll never forgive that one. Matthew 5, 43 through 48 says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you, that you may be children of the Father in heaven. He causes his son, the actual son, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's a, it's a lot of pressure <laughs> to live perfect the way that heavenly Father is. God understands that none of us are going to be perfect in the world. He knew that all of us were going to fall short. But when he says, be perfect, what he means is each and every day wake up and love even the worst of the worst of humanity. Because if you can love those people, then you can love anyone. But if you can't love those people and you can't forgive that one person that so hurt you in life, then you are holding yourself back from my love. And if you're holding yourself back from my love, then you can't love anyone. If you can't love anyone, that means you can't be a Christian. Because of that one person that you can't forgive, now you can't live for God. I know that's a tall order, you guys. I know that's a very bold statement. And I know a lot of you want to say, no, that's not true. Listen. Mark 11, 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. So that he can. Which means he can't if you refuse to forgive. There's another story in the Bible about a guy who comes before a king and he couldn't repay his debt. He comes before the king. king asks for the debt. He says, I can't pay it. I can't pay it. I, 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 Your majesty, I don't, I don't have that. I don't, I don't have the money for it and so on and so forth. And the king looked at him and he said, it's okay. Your debt's forgiven. Your debt's forgiven. You're free. You're okay. He said, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, your majesty. And the same man that was just forgiven goes out to someone who owes him just a few dollars and grabs him by the shirt and puts his face in his face and yells and screams in his face to pay him back his debt. And the king walks by and sees it. And the man that he just forgave, now he has thrown in prison to be tormented and tortured. Here's the thing. God doesn't have to throw us in prison to be tortured. You know why? Because we throw ourselves in prison. We do it all the time, you guys. We are so good at living bound by the smallest and most stupid little things like forgiveness. I refuse to forgive them. I'm not going to forgive that person. You have no idea what they did to me. You don't know what they did to me. They took everything from me. I'll never forgive them. 
If you'll never forgive them, then you'll never be free of them. And if you're not free from them, then you may as well have strapped their dead carcass to your body and walked around with it. That's also scripture. It's not worth it to hold on forgiveness in your hearts, you guys. And if you truly want to love the way that God intended for us to, then forgive. Forgive the worst of humanity. Forgive the people that so frustrate you because whatever they did to you hasn't done a thing in comparison to what you do to yourself every single day that you wake up and let what they did hold you back from being who God created you to be. Tonight I want to ask the worship team if you guys would come forward again. We're going to go into we're going to go into never let go. Some of you guys, you may be in here tonight and you, uh, you're you that person that you have somebody in your life that is holding you back from drawing closer to God and not only drawing closer to God, but also loving people effectively. If you guys are in here tonight, I'm going to offer two different ways that you can come and you can deal with that and you can really practice how to love people. I'm going to have my leadership team come forward first and foremost. And they're going to line out along the edges. And, and they're also going to leave some space up here. Some of you may not want to go and talk with a leader about your issue. And if that's the case, that's fine. Come up here.